In October 2020, about two weeks before the second COVID-19 lockdown, I decided to take the train to Castleford to revisit Fairburn Ings Nature Reserve. I dropped my bags at the hotel and headed up to Fairburn Ings. I was there by about 2pm and managed to catch this photo of a kingfisher. Later on, I filmed this little egret. I've probably mentioned this before, but in the 1980s, little egrets were fairly rare in the UK. They had been hunted to extinction because their plumage was used in women's hats and so on. But since then, they seem to have returned in great numbers and are not an unusual sight. Indeed, the same day, I saw two cattle egrets nearby. And there's a pair breeding at Fair Burnings. The little egret has black bill and black legs but with yellow feet. The cattle egret has yellow beak and yellow legs and confusingly is actually slightly smaller than the little egret. It is also much rarer. In fact my bird book dated 1997 doesn't even mention it but I believe they are becoming more common in the UK. You can tell that unlike a heron who stands completely still this actually stirs up the water with its feet to try and scare its prey out. It was starting to get a little bit dark, so I decided to head back in the general direction of Castleford. On the way, I spotted one or two starlings. It soon became apparent that I didn't really need a telephoto lens, so at that point I switched to my kit lens, which has a maximum focal length of 55mm. I use a crop sensor camera, so that's about 82.5mm full frame equivalent for those who are interested. That's better. Zoomed out to 18mm, that's 27 full frame equivalent. I can get the whole flock in shot. There are thousands of birds here, but I'm told that in December there are even more, maybe four times as many. Seeing this, you might not believe it, but the starling is actually in a serious decline in the United Kingdom. According to the RSPB, its numbers have declined by about 66% since the mid-1970s. Many starlings from Northern Europe visit the UK in the winter swelling their numbers. However, numbers have also been declining in Northern Europe. More and more starlings flood in, swelling the size of the flock. I'm told the size of the flock had attracted the attention of some predators 
maybe a peregrine falcon, but I didn't see anything. And then suddenly they all head for the reed beds and it's all over. The next day I headed straight back to Fair Burnings, pausing only to collect some portable nosh and passing through Castleford's Market Hall, a haven for pigeons and car park ticket machines. I then crossed over the River Eyre and, after passing this uh, amusing little metal merchant, I eventually came to what is known as the Castleford Cut. On the far side I turned right and headed along the towpath towards fair burnings. Anyway I hear you say, what did I see? Well the Kingfisher, or a Kingfisher, was back again. If you do make it to fair burnings, search out the Kingfisher screen which is where this film was taken. It isn't far from the visitor centre and you might not see one right away, but if you stand there long enough, sooner or later one is bound to turn up, although I may have been lucky. The Kingfisher screen is basically a kind of thick garden fence made out of planks, separating a rivulet from the path. At various places and at various heights there are holes cut into the planks which you can look through. Apparently it was only put up in 2009 and has been a great success. Sightings of kingfishers have greatly increased since then. In the United Kingdom Kingfisher will normally refer to the common kingfisher since it is the only species of kingfisher in the United Kingdom. In fact there are many different species of kingfisher and they all look fairly spectacular. Many of them live in tropical regions of the world. The smallest kingfisher is the African dwarf kingfisher which weighs between 9 and 12 grams. You might think that the largest kingfisher would be the giant kingfisher, but in fact it is Australia's laughing kookaburra, one of several kookaburra species in Australia. The female is slightly larger and may weigh as much as 465 grams. After that I didn't see anything too spectacular, some rather dark mallards, I think. A mute swan, a cormorant, and a rather nice fly agaric. And so another day dawns. Today I'm going to St. Aidan's Nature Reserve, which is a little way up the River Air from Fair Burnings. This is a coot. You may have heard the expression bald as a coot. Bald originally meant white haired, as in bald eagle. These are Canada geese. As you can see, there are an awful lot of these at St. Aidan's. They're not actually a native species, they were introduced from America about 300 years ago and have been increasing prodigiously since the Second World War. Like any successful species, they are considered by some to be a pest. Just a bit about the history of St. Aidan's Nature Reserve. It used to be an open cast mine. Think the sort of place where Top Gear used to destroy caravans. It continued as such until March 1988 when the Air and Calder Canal broke through the walls of the site and flooded it. It took them 10 years to pump out all the water, at which point mining operations resumed, 
but it finally closed in 2002. This enormous hunk of machinery is a walking drag line. It originally worked in America and was known as Clinchfield, but in 1954 was moved to the UK. It was rechristened Oddball because it used a 60 Hertz electricity supply, which is standard in America, but different to the 50 Hertz used in the UK, and this apparently caused some problems. It is claimed to be the second largest example of a walking drag line in Western Europe. It has not moved since 1999 when it walked to this site. It has a top speed of 0.19 miles per hour, taking steps of 6.6 .6 feet. Anyway, back to the birdies. I think this is a pair of Gadwal. This, I believe, is a male stone chat. Notice that the camera is determined to focus on something other than the bird. Looks like continuous autofocus was not a good choice. This is a male shoveler. Note the enormous beak and the way they use it. This is presumably where they get their name. And here's a pair of them so that you can compare the male and the female side by side. And here's a great crested grebe, possibly a young one, judging by its slightly dull colours. And then there's the European robin, not to be confused with the American robin, which is more closely related to a blackbird and is much larger in size and only a rare visitor to the UK. This is a cormorant. There seems to be some debate as to why cormorants stand like this with their wings spread out. I always thought it was because they were drying their wings. Ducks have a water repellent coating on their wings this also traps bubbles of air when they dive, making it quite hard for them to get very deep. There's no coating at all on the wings of a cormorant. This reduces their buoyancy and allows them to dive much deeper with less effort. But this means their feathers get wet and so they have to stand and dry them. Apparently there are other suggestions that it has something to do with digestion Apparently, if fed cold fish, they will stand like this for some time, warming themselves up. And if fed body temperature fish, they do not. But my money's still on the drying the feathers theory. This is a pair of widgeon. Most likely, they are winter visitors from further north or further east. They will return from whence they came in March or April. This is a grey heron, surely one of the stealthiest birds. Compare this to the little egret I showed you earlier on. Similar body shape, completely different strategy for catching fish. The little egret stirs up the water as much as it can and runs around. The heron hardly moves at all, except when it matters. Another new day. This time I thought I would leave my big lens back at the hotel and walk along the Leeds and Liverpool Canal until I got to Kirkstall Abbey.
Whilst walking along the canal, I was rather surprised to see this pair of goosander. It's not a particularly rare bird, but it's not one I see every day. These look like females since they have a brown head, but may in fact be immature males. Apologies for the quality of the film. I didn't really have a suitable lens and this is the best I could do. And so to Kirkstall Abbey, and it started to rain. We have Henry de Lacy to thank for the existence of Kirkstall Abbey. In 1147, he fell ill, and he promised God that if he survived his illness, he would build another abbey. He did indeed survive, and so donated money to the monks at Fountains Abbey, which is some 25 miles away, in order to build the new Kirkstall Abbey. Predictably enough, Henry VIII closed the abbey in 1539. Eventually, the land passed to one Colonel North, who presented the land to the city of Leeds in 1895. That's all, folks. Hope you liked it. Like, subscribe, whatever. Bye.